and welcome to the C19 Weekly. I'm your host, Nicholas Tatnetti, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. Today, in the next 10 to 12 minutes, we're going to be talking about how data scientists and informaticists are helping to fight the global pandemic. The goal here is to identify really innovative and exciting work that paves the way for the future for us to follow as fellow data scientists and fans of data scientists. This is for everyone who loves algorithms and computers and how they can be used to help address disease and further medicine. We wanna create a snapshot of what's happening right now. The most exciting work, especially has, as it has to relate to data and algorithms. This isn't intended to be comprehensive. So you're gonna see what I think are the most exciting things um, facing the field right now. And today we're gonna to be doing a little bit of review over the past few months, but in future versions, we'll be going over the past seven to 10 days to highlight the most innovative and most recent work. Might get a little technical here and there, but there'll be lots of colors, lots of pictures, and lots of explanations and metaphors to help us through. First, we're going to go over some basics of this new virus. So the new virus is called SARS-CoV-2, and it causes a disease called COVID-19. This virus is a lot like viruses we've seen before, in particular MERS and uh, other forms of SARS. We think the original patient was infected sometime in mid-November to mid-December in Wuhan, China. That timeline is actually continuing to be pressure pushed back a little bit as we learn more about the disease. The symptoms are similar in some ways to the flu, but with some important differences. And probably most important is that not everyone who has the infection actually shows any signs or symptoms. Many people will have mild or almost no disease at all. And younger people are less likely to have this severe form of the disease. We are seeing, however, that the US seems to have more younger patients who are having higher um, um, incidence of more severe disease. Here's what this, pro this virus looks like. You can see these spiky proteins on the outside. The virus is able to enter human cells by attaching these spiky proteins to a human protein called ACE2. And then with the help of another human protein called TMPRSS2, gets engulfed into the cell, the human cell. This ACE2 is a very important protein we've been studying in medicine for decades. It's used, it's important in cardiovascular disease, for example, and inhibitors of this protein are used to control blood pressure. This protein is expressed or is active in many different set tissues or cell types in our bodies. And you can see some of those here on the right. Um, and it is different for men and women in which, it's, in which cells it's, it is expressed or active. This actually might explain some of what we see in terms of the difference in the severity of the disease for men and women. And while ACE inhibitors are, have been studied for their effect on whether or not they contribute to the morbidity or mortality or the, the severeness of the disease, um, there's no strong evidence either way on if they are posing an additional risk. And there's new literature coming out on that all the time. I want to highlight three important papers since January that I think lay the groundwork for the show going forward when we talk about weekly work. And this is how they line up in the timeline. So I'm going to go back all the way to January and identify some work um, that was really some of the initial groundbreaking and seminal work coming out, studies in China, and then also kind of follow that up with two more recent articles. Um, one published in the middle of March and then one in the end of March. And really closing with this last one, which I think is a full court press type of approach using all aspects of the scientific method and engineering techniques to try to come up with new treatments for COVID-19. I think it's a particularly exciting um, paper that demonstrates how science can really be used and leveraged effectively. So let's dive in. First, on January 24th, 2020, Chan et al. published this paper in The Lancet titled, A Familial Cluster of Pneumonia Associated with the 2019 Novel Coronavirus Indicating Person-to-Person -person Transmission, a Study of a Familial Cluster. This is one of the original papers to share data on the disease, which makes it so important. They studied seven family members, six who had visited Wuhan, five later tested positive for the virus, and one who did not travel and that also tested positive. Nobody in this family cluster had visited the market, and that's what makes this paper so remarkable and so important for when it was published. It established that person-to-person -person spread was extremely likely and probably already happening. The conclusion in this study is also striking. Vigilant control measures are warranted at this early stage of the epidemic. 
just dive in a little bit on this paper. It has um, this section, which I highlighted. Unlike patient five, who was aged 10 years and non-compliant to parental guidance, patient six, who was aged seven years and reported by her mother to wear a mask for her time in Wuhan, was not infected. Also establishing that wearing a mask and listening to your parents can help you from getting infected. This was also one of the first papers to publish um, the CT scans of lungs and where we can really see the infection affecting the lungs and causing some lung damage and tissue damage in the lungs. The second paper I wanna highlight is published by Lee et al. in Science, March 16th, 2020, titled Substantial Undocumented Infection Facilitates the Rapid Dissemination of Novel Coronavirus. The goal here was to estimate the prevalence and contagiousness of undocumented novel coronavirus infections, undocumented because they're asymptomatic. The method was to use observations of reported infection in China from mobility data to identify potential points of infection and to estimate what that rate of infection might be from people who are asymptomatic. The result is also striking. 86% of all infections in China were undocumented prior to January 23rd. This accounts for up to 55% of documented infections. Undocumented infections were the source of 79% of documented cases. <clears throat> Here's what I like about this paper that makes it so important from a data science and informatics modeling perspective. And that is that they use models to prove that there must be asymptomatic spreading of this disease. The way they did that was they building a very simple model that had um, some assumptions about how contagious somebody might be before they start showing symptoms. And one of the models they included was that they would be not contagious until they started showing symptoms. And then what they did is they backed that up and they said, okay, well, what if someone was a day or two days, three days, a week, they could go uh, not show any symptoms, but still be contagious after they were initially infected. And what they found um, was that we, the only way to explain the rise in the cases that were observed in China from the data set that was available at this time was that people were spreading the disease before they were symptomatic. And this is the, con the concordance between their model and the data. What you see here are that the observations, the actual data that they observed, um, is pretty similar to this particular simulation. In the next slide, I'm going to show you they tested multiple different simulations. And so here is one where there is no spreading of disease while a patient is asymptomatic before they start showing symptoms. And here is one that shows that 55% of the infections can be attributed to undocumented cases, the spreading of disease from undocumented cases. And what you see is this pattern, which is much more similar to what we do observe in the actual observed data. So this is how they were able to use a model to help triangulate you know, exactly how infectious this is um, without having being, being able to measure that directly. A very nice way to apply modeling in order to determine something important for the disease. The final paper I wanna to talk to about is this all hands on deck, full stack scientific approach. This was published on March 20th, 2020. It's by Zhang et al, published in Science. The title is Crystal Structure of SARS-CoV-2 Main Protease Provides a Basis of Design of Improved Alpha Ketoketoamide Inhibitors. The goal here is to resolve the structures of this important protein called MPRO to the virus. This enzyme is essential for processing the polyproteins that are translated from the viral RNA. So the viruses get into the cell, they then take over the cell, and they produce more copies of their own proteins. Then what they need to do is they need to modify those proteins to make them work, to make them all fit together into this new virus particle. They do that with mPro. The method that they used was many. So first, they crystallized these structures, which means that you freeze these proteins in uh, a matrix, and then you shine x-rays on them, typically. In this case, they use this a different approach, but you shine something like light or energy on them, and you look at the diffraction pattern, and from that, you can actually determine what the structure is, because you can't look at th these particular proteins with your naked eye or even with any available microscope. So you have to invent these other approaches, and crystallization is a way for us to identify and look at the structure of proteins without being able to see them with our naked eyes. 
They then did a whole bunch of additional chemistry experiments where they synthesized new molecules, brand new, potentially new drugs, and they tested whether they were active against this protein that they isolated called MPRO, this important viral protein. The result is that they found that, first off, they found that the structure of this protein, MPRO, is similar between SARS-CoV-2 and the other SARS-CoV virus that we know. They also found that they were able to synthesize a compound, which they call 13B, that inhibits the activity of this protein significantly, and I'll show you some data on that. Their conclusion is that compound 13B, this novel compound, is a promising new drug candidate to promote, to prohibit viral replication, and it's unlikely to be toxic to humans. So I'm going to show you a little bit of their experimental results because they're really cool to look at. So first off, this is the structure that they found for their protein, mPro. This is with that process that we were talking about called crystallization, LCP crystallography. And so um, this, uh, these are proteins. I'm going to flip over and show you a little bit of, give you a sense of scale for these proteins. And I found this amazing website that is made available by the University of Utah that starts to show scale. So here we have some common um, daily items, piece of paper, coffee bean, grain of rice. And we're talking about proteins. So we're going to zoom in here. And you can see here we have a human egg, an amoeba, still quite large things. Here we have a skin cell. You can see red blood cells starting to come up. And now we're getting to DNA. This is a chromosome, one whole chromosome all packed together, human chromosome. These are bacteria, the sizes of bacteria, um, other subcellular components. Here's now we get into the size of what viruses are. So we can imagine that the new virus is also going to in this range. And then finally here is where we start to get to individual proteins and the sizes of individual proteins. So this is why we can't see it with a microscope. It's just too small. We could only see something maybe about this big with a microscope, an optical microscope. But with this approach that, that they use, you can actually look at the structure of a protein and you can determine that it looks like this. And just to give you a little view again about the size and scale that we're looking at. So this is this protein structure. So that's step one. Step two was to computationally um, estimate a particular, some compounds, build some compounds, and then computationally estimate their effectiveness at blocking the function of this protein. And you do that using these algorithms called molecular dynamics algorithms that model the interactions between proteins and potential new drugs. And they did that, and they showed that this drug fit well inside this protein and has the potential, therefore, to block it. So you design a drug that kind of goes into a protein and messes things up. And that's what they're hoping is happening here. These are the experimental results that they were able to find. And what we're showing here, here's 13B. This is the structure of this compound. And when they assay the activity of this protein, when in the presence of this new compound called 13B, they see that it decreases as you increase the amount of this compound. And that's what you want to see when you're doing new drug discovery projects. You want to see that your target protein's activity is dependent on the concentration or the amount of the new compound that you have. And so you can see they compared these two, which are very similar, and yet one has a very dramatic effect on activity where one does not. And this is very common. You can see that there's only a couple of groups that are different between these two compounds, but that makes all the difference in activity. While these results haven't been validated completely, they are extremely promising, and I'm sure that they are following up. One of the features we're going to have in this show is that we'll come back to these efforts and talk to these scientists and see where they're at um, with these studies. We're also going to highlight ways to get involved. And so for this first episode, we've compiled a list of different projects where you can volunteer and you can register your skills, talents, whether they're data science, in graphic design, um, or statistical analysis, reading papers, whatever it might be, organization, project management, you can sign up, say what your skills are and what you'd like to work on. I encourage you all to do so. There's also a lot of other projects that have made data available. There's more data coming out every day. I know that the New York, New York City has made a ton of data available just recently, just this past week. 
I encourage you to use those open data, open city resources and, and run your own experiments. And we're also gonna do some highlights. And so for our first highlight, we're gonna highlight a project called COVID Watcher. COVID Watcher, full disclosure, is a project I'm involved with at Columbia University. In the future though, we'll be going around and highlighting all types of projects from all over the world that um, use people, use volunteers, use innovative methods, use data science, use engineering approaches to try to advance our fight against COVID-19. COVID Watcher is an app and a website that we produced to collect data from New Yorkers to help guide resources in, from the city and resources from the hospital to help our frontline workers. And I'm just gonna show you a little screenshot of the app. Feel free to go to covidwatcher.org and check out more about it. That's it for our first one. I'd like to thank my executive producer, Scott McGrath, and I'd like to thank all of you and all of our student volunteers who have helped us review so many great papers. Looking forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>